the law and you a look at laws in st vincent and the grenadines which affect our daily lives the law and the you law presented and by you. lawyer panel r campbell qc and brought to you on svg tv as a public service ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters boys and girls greetings welcome to another presentation in this public service nation building series the law and you this is program number 963 coming to you on Monday, the 17th of February, 2020. On this program, I will speak to you on the topic, Changing the System, 18 years ago. But before beginning, let me, as usual, express my deepest condolences to all families which have suffered recent bereavements, and my heart continues to go out for the families of those who have been killed as a result of violence. I promised last week that this week I would deliver a speech I made at the New Democratic Party Convention, of which I was chairman, 18 years ago. The exact date of, date of delivery was the 18th of November, 2001. And the occasion was the delivery of chairman's opening remarks at our annual general convention. And as I read, I hope you will understand what I was trying to persuade the party to do. Unfortunately, I didn't really succeed in persuading my colleagues to take constitutional and system systemic changes as seriously as we ought to have done. But having delivered my protocol greetings, I continued by saying, fraternal greetings from me, the chairman of the New Democratic Party, on this the occasion of the annual convention of the New Democratic Party held today, Sunday, 18th November, 2001. It will be an honor for me later this morning to introduce our guest speaker. Permit me to inform you in advance, however, that the Honorable Mrs. Yuna Clark is a member of the New York City Council. She is the elected member for the 40th Council District in New York. There are about 148 registered voters in Mrs. Clark's district. New York City Council is made up of 51 districts, representing a total of over 8 million people. The population of St. Vincent and Grenadines is currently estimated at between 115,000 and 120,000 persons. In the March 2001 elections, there were 84,536 registered voters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Our entire electorate in this country, therefore, is 56.75% of Mrs. Clark's 40th district in New York. During the past week, President Putin of Russia visited the United States of America as guest of President Bush. In public, the two world leaders behaved like bosom buddies. We are told that in private, the chemistry between the two of them was obviously vibrant. Two men whose countries almost exchanged nuclear weapons in the Cuban Missile Crisis when I was about 16 years old, a mere 40 years ago. Remember that I was speaking 
in 2001. Brothers and sisters, having delivered that introduction, I now come to the points I am imploring you and this nation to consider. One, the world has recently gone through dramatic changes in thinking as a result of the crisis which exploded on the 11th September 2001. Question, do we have a crisis in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in the OECS, in the Caribbean? I believe the answer is yes, yes, yes. Two, I believe that we in the Caribbean have been undergoing crises in trade, in aid, in governance, in AIDS, in unemployment, in crime, and in other aspects of our socioeconomic and political spheres. Three, I do not believe that our present political systems in the Caribbean can bear the strain of coping with the multiple crises we face today, crises which will multiply in the future. Four, our present political system in the Caribbean is centered on party politics. Two months ago, we should have observed the 50th anniversary of party politics here in St. Vincent. As it has evolved and as it has been practiced in the Caribbean these past 50 years, Party politics is now, in my considered opinion, the biggest obstacle to social, economic, and political development in these places. I repeat, party politics is now, in my considered opinion, the biggest obstacle to social, economic, and political development in these places. When the President of the United States of America and the President of Russia can display between them more brotherly love and respect than you can see between any Caribbean Prime Minister and the corresponding leader of the opposition in that country, something is wrong with the system. When there is no avenue for the meaningful utilization by the nation of the talents of a development banking expert like the Honorable Anna Eustace, leader of the opposition, in a time of manifest economic crisis, something is wrong with the system. When a nation invests 35 years of parliamentary experience, including 16 and a half years experience as Prime Minister, in Sir James Mitchell, a man who is still in full command of his faculties, and the nation has no institutional mechanism to continually tap the richness of that experience in the interest of nation building, Something is wrong with the system. When competent men and women are summarily fired from their sources of livelihood by reason of their constitutionally protected freedom of political choice, something is wrong with the system. Brothers and sisters, in common with the rest of the world, we in this region have to begin to think the unthinkable. We have to break the mental shackles of the past 50 years and reject the notion that the majority is elected to propose and the minority is elected to oppose. We need a political system and a political culture in which all are elected to serve. 
Political tribalism must be abandoned. These small microstates cannot remain viable in a hostile global environment if we persist with a political system which dictates that at any time only one set of people can succeed and that the other set of people have either to suck salt or to suck their teeth. In our Jurassic political system, too many talented people are forcibly sidelined by virtue of their political affiliation, even as we lament the problem of scarce, trained manpower resources. Parties in government dare not ask for advice from parties in the opposition. Parties in opposition dare not offer to help lest they be deemed to be selling out. Those who created party politics in England and elsewhere never intended the system to degenerate to the vicious levels as practiced in the Caribbean. In many fundamental ways, party politics as practiced in the Caribbean result in a denial of democracy. Who would have thought that Eastern Europe and almost all of the rest of the former communist world would have abandoned communism? But that has happened in our lifetime. There is therefore no political system which cannot be abandoned or radically altered when it has outlived its usefulness in its evolved form. We in these parts need a new political system. Our viability depends on change. We in St. Vincent and the Grenadines need a new constitution. I say a new constitution. We have to go back to the drawing boards with new thinking caps on our heads. It will not be enough to tinker with the system here and there or to make a few innocuous amendments here and there. We have to be imaginative. We have to draw on the experience of the rest of the Caribbean and the world. I am not advocating that we abolish political parties or that we should have a one-party system. What I am saying is that a new constitution should render it impossible for one political party to so arrange matters as to deprive the nation of the talent of its able-bodied men and women who support or belong to the party in opposition. I wish to stimulate you with this thought. The Honorable Council Member Mrs. Una Clark is a Democrat. But there is no government or opposition in the New York City Council. When her council deliberates, it does so as a body of men and women, some Republican, some Democrat, some Independent, whose central aim is to do the best for New York City. We in this nation need to seek our inspiration from models like that. I continued my speech of November 2001 to the Democratic Party Convention, to those who have just tuned in. If we are in a crisis, and we are, we have to act like other people who face crises. We have to think the unthinkable. We have to be politically creative. We have to devise new institutions, new modalities. 
we need a new democracy. Our parliamentary system is now a caricature of what it was designed to be. We do not have parliamentary supremacy. We have executive supremacy. Our system is to compartmentalized. We need an all-inclusive system of decision-making which will allow the nation to benefit from the creative talents of all the people all the time. We cannot continue with business as usual. We cannot continue to depend on the goodwill and statesmanship of those leaders who respect us and to suffer the slings and arrows of those leaders who do not respect us. This new democratic party administered the affairs of this nation as a one-party government from 1989 to 1994 with not a single opposition member of the, in the parliament. And we are proud to remind the nation that throughout that period, not a single person took the government to court for any alleged violation of his or her human rights. That was because we had a leader who respected the people, a leader who demonstrated goodwill, and a statesman. During our period in office, civil servants who had openly, and in some cases obnoxiously, supported the then opposition Labour Party, flourished and gained promotion and held the most important positions in the hierarchy. Even those of doubtful competence were promoted. NDP supporters had to struggle for advancement in many cases. But do not direct your attention to personalities. Do not ascribe those aberrations in the system to the wickedness of this person or that person. The truth is that the political system not only tolerates victimization, the system encourages it. We have no checks and balances in our political system as there are in the United States. In our system, it is winner takes all. If the winner is an extremist, you get extremist tendencies. If the winner is a moderate, you get moderate tendencies. We need a system in which it does not really matter whom you get. A system that does not glorify tribalism. A system that promotes true and genuine democracy. A system in which the ballot you cast does not determine whether your children eat or starve. A system that does not reduce almost half of the nation's brightest brains to intellectual impotence. A system in which the engine of state is firing on all cylinders all the time. This country, like others in the OECS, has, since September 11, 2001, entered what I fear is likely to be a permanent state of economic emergency. Sadly, our political systems do not permit us even to understand the full dimensions of our plight, let alone prepare us to devise and to cope with effective strategies for survival. It is my settled fear that without radical and fundamental change to our political system, we in the Caribbean will not weather the economic storms I see on the horizon. 
We must start a serious dialogue now. If we do nothing, then surely nothing will do for us. Let us begin now. Thank you. That was the end of the address I delivered at the opening of the New Democratic Party Annual Convention on the 18th of November, 2001. And I will end with quoting the protocol. I said, Honorable Annie Eustace, President of NDP and Leader of the Opposition, and Mrs. Eustace, Honorable elected representatives and senators of the NDP and spouses, Right Honorable Sir James Mitchell, founder and past president of the NDP and former Prime Minister of St. Vincent and Grenadines, our most distinguished guest speaker, in New York Council member, the Honorable Mrs. Una Clark, vice presidents, secretary general, and other office holders of the NDP. President and other executive members of the Women's Committee of the NDP. President and other executive members of the Young Democrats. Members of the Diplomatic Corps. Representatives of the print and electronic media. Specially invited guests. Members of the Central Committee and of the Secretariat of NDP. Delegates, card-carrying members, and supporters of NDP members of the viewing and listening audiences. Good morning. That is how I started that address. Excuse me. I have quoted that address I delivered 18 years ago for the benefit of those who feel that the things I've been advocating recently are only ideas that came into my head since I'm out of politics. My abiding regret, however, is that I did not succeed in convincing my colleagues at the time of the necessity for changes in the political system. I believe much of what I said fell on deaf ears. Much of what I said would have fallen on unresponsive ears. But had my party taken me seriously, and had my party seriously considered the need to change the system, things would have been far different in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. My party had the opportunity in 2009 to change the political system in a radical way, in a fundamental way, in a way which have, would have guaranteed that even if they continued in opposition, they would have had much more power and influence than is the case under the present system which my party said they wanted to keep. So when members of my party lament and moan and groan and cuss and carry on, they must remember they had the chance to make things different, to make it more democratic for the society to function. And uh, they rejected that opportunity. They said, no, leave the Constitution as it was. So they left the Constitution as it is. And now 
many of them are balling and saying how Ralph this and Ralph that and so on. Well, Ralph had a right to be what he is because <laughs> when Ralph, and I say so with no disrespect, but just in the context of this discussion, when he proposed a reduction of the powers of the Prime Minister, my party said, no, leave things as they are. So that is why I have a very strict attitude towards this mourning and groaning of the members of my party. Because what has unfolded politically since the rejection of the constitutional proposals in 2009 has not surprised me at all. I don't intend to make another presentation like this for quite some time. We are entering into what I call the political season that is increasingly we've we'll been nearer and nearer to general elections. And I would have decided to have very little more to say about political matters or quasi-political matters, I will stick to legal matters. But what I see on the horizon is not pleasant. And what I see on the horizon will make a lot of people angry, disgusted, I hopefully, I hope they will, hopefully it will make them more thoughtful. But I leave you with the central theme of my discourse is that in politics, things are not going to get any better as long as we have the system we have. <laughs> because the present system says that the government has all the power and the opposition has no power at all. Under that system, don't look for anything different or better than has happened in the past 18 years since I delivered this address. So next week, Monday Divi will return to legal matters, strictly speaking. Okay? That is all from this program of the Law and You, program number 963. I look forward to being of further service to you next week, Monday Divi, for another presentation in this public service nation-building series, The Law and You. Belated happy Valentine to one and all. May the good Lord continue to bless us all. The Law and You, a look at laws in St. Vincent and the Grenadines which affect our daily lives. The Law and You, presented by lawyer panel R. Campbell, QC, and brought to you on SVG TV as a public service.